Good afternoon, students and staff. Thank you for taking this time this afternoon to join us for this assembly. As all of you will be aware, on May 25th, George Floyd, a black man living in Minneapolis in the United States, was killed by a police officer while being arrested. This was a terrible event that is having repercussions around the world. Today, we want to come together as a community and share thoughts and voices that we hope might help you in your thinking about this incident and in deciding what you will do about it. All of you will be at different places in terms of your reactions to this incident and your understanding of the event's significance. We respect that. Some of you may have thought of this as essentially an American event. Others may think that racism is something that only a small minority of mean people participate in. But I know that there are others of you who have experienced racism directly and know it is neither an exclusively American problem, nor is it something that is driven by the acts of a few mean people. And finally, I know that for many of us, discussing racism is very difficult. Racism is defined as a form of discrimination based on race. Discrimination involves treating people differently when they don't deserve to be treated differently. No one deserves to be treated differently because of the color of the skin. And yet we know that people all over the world, including those in our own country, are treated differently because their skin is a different color. This happens both as intentional acts and as a result of a social system that is built on a long history of racism. Whether intentional or systemic, racism is not right and it must stop. What we have come to understand about racism is that despite the fact that many people believe that racism is wrong, racism continues to exist, which raises the question for all of us here today. What can we do to stop it? We all have to be involved in finding answers to this question. Now we want you to know that as difficult as the discussion of racism is, we think it is very important. Why is it so important? It is important because racism threatens what is most valuable to us all. The belief that we are all equally worthy of respect and care. Racism contradicts the very principles on which our society has been built, justice and the protection of life, liberty and security, and the dreams that we hold for all of humankind, everlasting peace. We must discuss racism so that we can protect these values and discover our role in bringing it to an end. And most important in this discussion is the need for us to hear the voices of those who have suffered because of racism. If we wish to express our solidarity with them, we must first hear their suffering. Today, you have an opportunity to do that. So I encourage you to listen and reflect on the messages you hear today. And we hope in the end, you will feel empowered to stand together with people of every race, and particularly at this time with the Black Lives Matter movement and black people who suffer discrimination. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Students and staff, if there was ever an assembly where I wish we were all together in the gym at 1320, it is today. This is such an important issue to talk about and being apart makes it feel even more difficult. What is missing in today's assembly are our student and staff voices. These voices are key to helping us navigate a collective way forward to ensure we are all part of the solution. If we were together in the past few days, I would have asked our student leaders to help craft the commitment statement using their ideas and language. As that is not possible right now, we have started with what I will read and hope it serves its purpose as a starting point, not a finishing point. We all have a lot of learning to do together to ensure we understand the systemic racism faced by black people and how we can be part of the solution. At the York School, 
We stand against racism and our mission as a school includes a commitment to both diversity and inclusivity. The murder of George Floyd while in police custody, as well as the ripple effect his death has had here in Canada and worldwide has been felt deeply by all of us. It has prompted much action as well as much reflection and a multitude of emotions. As a school, as an employer, as a community, we stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and we reject the systemic racism responsible for so much of the injustice and the inequality that exists in our society today. But standing against racism in all forms is not enough. As a place of learning, as a school, we must do better. We have an obligation as educators to equip you, our students, to be critical thinkers who are globally minded and action driven. As an IB World School, citizenship is one of our core values and it guides everything that we do. Our curriculum across all grades includes lessons on how to be upstanders rather than bystanders, how to have uncomfortable conversations and how to be the change you want to see in the world around you. In order to make a difference, in order to truly make a difference, we must do more. In addition to listening, learning, and reflecting, our plan of action includes review and update our current mission statement on diversity and inclusivity to ensure it reflects the proactive focus of our commitment to make a difference. Partner with local community diversity leaders to better understand the issues of those directly impacted by racism and examine our policies, curriculum, and provide staff diversity training over the coming months to ensure that our anti-racism stance is reflected throughout. Commit to hosting conversations about race and inequality with students, faculty, and staff in assemblies and meetings as well as our homeroom and advisor programs, creating a safe space to share their thoughts, ideas, and feelings. These are our initial steps. The path ahead for our school will involve all members of our community, as well as racial and diversity experts, and will incorporate a thoughtful, long-term approach that builds on where we are now to get us where we need to be. Students, staff, parents, and community leaders. Together, we will take the action needed to lead us in a better direction for growth and change. Following this assembly, there will be an opportunity to continue the conversation for our students. Please listen for the instructions at the end of our time today. To our staff, this week's Coffee Connects is the beginning of conversations to listen and learn together how we can continue to move our school forward. Now I will turn it over to Mr. Hanna to introduce our guest speaker. I'm very pleased to welcome back Alexi Chere de Combe to the York School. Alexi graduated from the York School with both the IB diploma and the OSSD in 2013. In that year, Alexi was our school's head boy, what we now call co-chair of student council. After York, Alexi went to McGill University where he studied economics. And throughout his undergraduate years, he worked at various tech firms in both Montreal and Toronto. Alexi is currently working in a data analytics firm here in Toronto. Last week, Alexi reached out to both Mr. Hamilton and myself. He shared with us an article he had written for an online magazine. He was motivated by the seismic of social upheaval that we are witnessing these days. And he wrote an incredibly moving piece about his experiences and his complacency with the systemic injustices we are seeing in this world. Alexis will speak to us now about this. Please welcome Alexi Chere de Con. Congratulations to finishing the school year despite um, all the incredible obstacles you've faced. As a former Yorkie, I can only be 
begin to understand everything you guys have gone through, teachers and students included. You know, the endless tests, quizzes, IAs, projects, and essays are hard enough for me without the stress of a pandemic and political turmoil to reconcile. <laughs> I, I had a great time at York when I was a student. I was in debating, like I'm sure a lot of you are. I played for the soccer team and I was in student council. I was a happy student and I was active and really enjoyed my time there. And during my time at York, there was only one thing that really negatively distracted me, and that was my identity in relation to the color of my skin. I don't know if it's still the case today, but there weren't many students that looked like me when I was at York. And that is not a reflection on York, but more on society and the opportunities that are provided to people of color today. Um, and let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean. I have a white mother and a black father. And like many mixed kids, I never knew who I was or what group I belonged to. I was too black for white society and I was too white for black society. I always felt alone and I never had a racial community I could really identify with. It took me a lot of time, reflection, confusion and tears to develop my own identity and become the Alexi that everyone knows today. When I was part of the debate club, you know, that wasn't a black activity at all. I would rarely see people of color at tournaments and I was often reminded that it wasn't really black of me to be into debating. I was never a team on any of the York basketball teams. And I was often reminded that it was weird that I didn't try out. Um, I think that no kid should have racial stereotypes pushed on them by society. And I hope that no mixed child goes through the confusion and anger that I did as a result of those stereotypes. It's those social norms and stereotypes that we're consciously and unconsciously reinforcing that lay the foundation for the racial divides that we see today and you're all seeing in the news today. It starts with every single one of us. And with that being said, I think, I think it's important to note the privilege that I have and that a lot of us have. I went to the York School, an expensive private school where all of us have access to laptops, tech labs, international trips and after school activities. And this was before you guys said that crazy update that you've done to the school since I graduated. I have a university degree and I was able to graduate debt free. I have a roof over my head, I have food in my fridge and I have a career in technology that I'm passionate about. Um, I have time to think and I'm not constantly worrying for my safety or the well being of people that depend on me. Um, it took me a long time to come to this conclusion, but I am a privileged person of color and I've not been doing my part. And that, that's due to several things. You know, like many of us here today, I've always surrounded myself with people who intellectually challenge me and whose opinions I respect. And, you know, inadvertently, all of my social circles, all of them have been members of the privileged sector of society in which I've spent most of my life. I'm sure a lot of people here can relate to that. Most, if not all, of my close friends are private school and university educated with a reliable source of income. And for a lot of us, you know, racism is a foreign concept that's studied. You study it in English class when you read To Kill a Mockingbird. You study it in history class with Mr. Burkett when you read about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And you study it in your world issues class with Ms. Gardner when you learn of the racial genocides that have occurred and are happening globally. Racism is a bad thing that happens to people in those places or back then, you know? When you don't experience it and you only read about it, it's very easy to ignore it and forget about it. In my case, it led me to become apathetic. I lived in a very comfortable bubble of privilege. I disassociated and mentally repressed the racial inequalities around me, even though I experienced them myself. And, you know, I've, I've always been appreciative of, of my lot in life. I've always appreciated the opportunities I was provided. You know, my parents always reminded me of the sacrifices they made to empower me with a quality education and a robust set of values. Growing up, my parents would always tell me, ils peuvent tout prendre, mais ils ne peuvent pas prendre ta connaissance. And uh, for everyone speaking French, they know what that means. But for everyone else, that means they can take everything, but they can't take your knowledge. 
And this is a mindset a lot of immigrants and invisible minorities have, because education is the first step to a brighter future for our community. In my case, I am the second generation in my family to go to university, and I'm the first generation to ever go to private school. My parents never got either of those opportunities. Um, now most colored households have the talk. You know, where your parents warn you about how you'll be treated as a visible minority and how to respond to the police when you encounter them. Not if, when. It's an ine inevitability. And if you don't know, the basic rules are keep your hands visible, be very clear when you speak to the officer, always have your ID and documentation ready, and speak only when spoken to, making sure your tone is right. Racism in society you know, becomes so normalized that in my case, I considered the casual racism I dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis as a fact of life. I just had to play it smart, learn as much as possible, and I would do fine. And that's what I did, you know? But the issue is that I did learn and adapt, but I didn't actively challenge the status quo. I didn't challenge the normalized racism in society. You know, my presence in a store in the wealthier and mostly white part of town was questioned by an employee of the store. I concluded that, you know, I wasn't dressing well enough to be in that area. It didn't matter that white people dressed the same way when not receiving the same treatment as me. This was my reality. And I started dressing in more expensive clothes to fit in. But, you know, we all know that I never really truly fit in. You know, and I was followed by security while out with friends in high school when I was a Yorkie. I internalized the fact that I would need to change my behavior to not be perceived as suspicious. But you know, we all know that I would always be considered suspicious. I'm a big guy, male and black. And uh, that means that I'm always going to be a suspect in today's world. Whenever I interact with the police, I'm always, always ready to provide any and all documentation and I actively emphasize the slowness of my movements to prevent any mistakes. I'm sure you've all seen those mistakes on TV and on the internet. And I just, I don't wanna be another one of those mistakes. Even just seeing police officers brings about a sense of anxiousness, you know, no matter how small. I always have the same lingering thoughts in the back of my mind. How should I behave? Am I doing something wrong? And how can I be less suspicious? Even if I'm just walking down the street, I'm always thinking, what, what can I do differently to not get their attention? And that's my reality and the reality of millions of people of color in, in the US, Canada, and the world. We need to prove our innocence. We need to prove our honesty and we need to prove our existence as the white community. And many people on this call here today, you know, you're rightly presumed innocent and you're warmed as, your, your word is automatically deemed true. I think that's something that we need, we need to change. You know, I, I always told myself that one day when I was in a position of influence, I would work towards effecting change and progress. When I was in grade 10, the Trayvon Martin murder happened. And I remember working on a project in our uh, American history class where we examined racial bias and we delved deep into the details of Trayvon Martin and Rodney King exploring the circumstances that led to their deaths. And I wanna thank Mr. Brickhead directly here because that was a really good class. And I have really fond memories of uh, that class and the exploration we went into in terms of race. For anyone on this call who, who doesn't know, Trayvon Martin was a black 17 year old boy who was walking through a white community and was shot dead because a citizen assumed he was a criminal. He was the same age as a few of you. He was in grade 11 when he was killed. The murderer did not go to jail for killing Trayvon Martin. Because the United States seemed so much more broken and lethal than you know, my reality in Canada, at the time, it just it led me to further accept the racial discomfort. You know, I mentioned earlier as it was so trivial in comparison. I'd never been shot at. You know, I'd been stopped by the police, but no one had ever physically hurt me or shot at me or 
killed the black person I knew here in Canada. Like there's the murders of Philando Castile, Eric Gardner, Gotham Jean, Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and you know more. The, the list is endless. You know, further cemented my acceptance of the status quo and my apathy towards any real progress. And if you haven't heard of these people, I encourage you to Google their names and read about them and what happened to them. All of these murders happened in the past seven years since my graduation from York. But, you know, what, when is one day? What does progress mean? How long are we willing to wait for, for this to change? You know, George Floyd's murder sparked a change in myself and the world two weeks ago, so that we can't wait any longer. I hope that everyone today knows what happened to George Floyd. He was a man who advocated against violence and was killed on camera by the Minneapolis police. A white police officer kneeled on George's neck for eight minutes and 36 seconds while three officers watched and bystanders objected helplessly. They watched him die right in front of them. The murder of George Floyd affected me because of the incredible cruelty and injustice, but also because of the introspection it forced upon me. My first instinct when I saw the video was, you know, cops will get away with it again. You know, that's always happens. Another black man had needlessly been murdered and there was nothing that I could do about it. It happened so frequently that I got numb to it. You know, a lot of us got numb to it. That's why, you know, I try not to be another mistake. You know, whereas the, the movement has grown and I've seen the inspirational footage of the black community standing up to the discrimination we face on a daily basis, my bubble finally popped. I stayed up until the early morning almost every day after May 25th, when George died, watching the murder and protest footage over and over again. I cried a lot and I felt a sense of guilt. I was an emotional wreck for a long time and I still kind of am today because of the truths that sparked in me that I've been forced to reflect on and you know, publicly acknowledge. Now, I need to make it very clear that I am a person of color of privilege. That means it's my responsibility to speak for those who don't have the means, time, or ability to speak for themselves. I'm done staying quiet, remaining apathetic, and shrugging off the injustices we experience and witness so frequently. And I'm done waiting for progress and accepting the statements from government leaders that you know, try to reduce reduce discussion and slow down any significant change. And finally, I'm just I'm done convincing myself that one day I'll work towards making a change in a broken system that's affected me since I was born. And it's not something that I'm going to ever get over. It's something that I've only begun to reconcile, and something I'm going to think of and integrate in my value system as I continue to live my life and affect change on a day-to-day -day basis. And before I go on, I, I want to make something clear to everyone. The Black Lives Matter movement is not protests, riots, social media campaigns, or viral videos you know, that you've seen on TV, Reddit, the internet. It's a collection of sons, daughters, fathers and mothers who have experienced racial abuse, discrimination and prejudice and are standing up for our rightful existence in this world. You know, whether we were beaten in the streets, shot or casually discriminated against on a daily basis, it's unjust and it, just, it can't continue any longer. No way. After I came to these realizations myself, which I'm sure many of you have as well. 
the next step was, you know, what can I do? What can we do? This is a problem I've comfortably ignored and repressed for most of my life. How can I get involved in the Black Lives Movement? And I say this in all sincerity to everyone on this call. Doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, what your grades are. We can all start affecting change starting today. You just have to make it a part of your everyday value system. How you spend your money, where you work, and who you vote for when, when you're able to vote. You know, first step is try buying some of your meals from black restaurants, support black businesses who are already at a disadvantage. You will not believe how delicious Ethiopian, Jamaican, Haitian, and Nigerian food is, you know, amongst others. If you have Black friends, teachers, neighbors, or family, talk to them. Ask them about their experiences. Learn about their history and try to learn about their people's history. Speak to your friends and family about this. This shouldn't be an embarrassing topic or something we all choose to ignore because it's, you know, it's inconvenient to talk about it's awkward to talk about you should talk about it openly with your friends and family and you know try and explore creative ways how you can help that's really the first step to any impactful change before you know donating you know or going to any protests that's really the first step and when you do start working and voting make it a part of your decision making process do your colleagues display racist tendencies does the politician you vote for support practices that hurt marginalized communities? You can make a big difference by choosing where you work, speaking out against racist behavior, and electing officials that support you know, effective legal and police reform. And uh, now going back to how we can affect change internally, racism and stereotyping are learned concepts. And they can be unlearned. No one is born a racist and no one is born with racist tendencies. I think that you know true racists are in the minority. There is, in terms of the percentage of the global population, they are a very small minority. It's the racist you know, reflexes, norms that are pervasive in society today that affect people of color like me on a daily basis whether it's the media's negative portrayal of black men or the woman who tightly clutches her purse, you know, whenever a black man is close to her. These racist behaviors are taught and they're enforced by the societal norms that we accept. And I think it's really important that we make ourselves aware of these behaviors, our conscious and unconscious beliefs and our ability to enact change. You know, no one is perfect. Even I had some of these behaviors. I'm sure I still have some of them. But it's important that we work on ourselves in this aspect and just reflect internally on how we behave and how we can adjust our behavior. And look, if you if you watch the news or spend any time on the internet these days, you'll see that there are many civil rights codes being thrown around. Uh, there's one that really made an impact on me, and it was from Malcolm X when he was reflecting on the government and white society's engagement on social reform. And he astutely said, that if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound that the blow made. And they haven't even pulled the knife out, much less heal the wound. They won't even admit the knife is there. Through the many protests, riots, and social movements of the past decades, I can confidently say that we have only just begun to acknowledge the racism that is pervasive in society today. I think, you know, with your support, we should continue to acknowledge and pull out the knife of racism through effective legal and social reform and heal the wound to our everyday actions, like I mentioned earlier. It isn't up to only Black people. It can't be anymore. Decisive action needs to be taken by each and every one of us 
to really make a change. I started by doing something that, you know, I think that I should have done a long time ago. I've become a member and donated to two organizations. They're called Campaign Zero and the Black Legal Action Center. Campaign Zero is an American organization dedicated to the analysis of policing practices across the United States, research to identify effective solutions to end police violence, technical assistance to organizers leading police accountability campaigns, and the development of model legislation and advocacy to end police violence nationwide. I'm a tech guy, so I really appreciated the fact that they use data you know, from over 100 cities in America police data to design changes in police procedures and laws that would significantly reduce violence against people of color. The second organization that I donated to and became a member of was, is the Black Legal Action Center. It's a Canadian nonprofit community legal clinic that provides free legal services for low or no income black residents of Ontario. Their mission is to educate, advocate and litigate to combat individual and systemic anti black racism in Ontario. Because it exists. And uh, you know, this organization helps fight systemic racism right in our backyard, right in Toronto. All of you students here in this assembly today, you're all future leaders and you're members, you're already members of a community of leaders. And I strongly encourage you all to publicly voice your support for the advancement of the black community. It's through your leadership that you will enable, you know, spaces for conversation. So I'm gonna do it for you. Or the more is through your action that you'll be able to catalyze change in your own communities. You'll be able to spark the change by your behavior. To the York School faculty, I encourage you to focus your light on the marginalized communities of Toronto. I understand that service trips around the world are great in building a global mindset in our students, and it's also a great way to attract students to the school but please increase your focus on the problems that we have right here at home. Continuously examine with your students the history of racism in Canada and the how and why it is persisting today. That's something I never learned when I was a Yorkie. Examine the biases and behaviors we all have and how we can work towards self-improvement with your students. If you have the means, I encourage you to donate your time and or your money to an organization that will affect positive change in your community and the black community at large. You know, at the end of the day, we all need to speak up, vote and stop accepting the broken reality that has impacted the black community for generations. I was quiet for too long and I only wish that I had started to speak up when I was your age. Um, I want to just end by saying, I really appreciate the fact that the York School invited me to speak to you today and that you all recognize the privilege and advantage in life that you have. This is what will you know, give us a better future because of the students of today, who are strong leaders of tomorrow. Thanks for listening and congratulations to all of you on another year of learning and growth. Have a fun summer and remember to speak up. You are powerful. Thank you, Alexis. That was wonderful. Thank you for coming back to the York School and sharing your very, very thoughtful methods with us. We're very pleased to have all of our alumni return to the York School. And Alexi, we're honored that you're associated with our school. Thank you again.
As a starting place in discussions in the middle school, Ms. Selv and I again challenged her students and later our staff to take an internal assessment of how comfortable they are talking about racism. I'd like to ask everyone participating in this assembly to take a moment to consider how comfortable you are to talk about race and racism and then stop and consider for a moment why or why not you are comfortable talking about the subject. We know that for many people, talking about racism is uncomfortable. Our work now is to sit with the discomfort, both in our thoughts and in our interactions, our inclination is to move away from uncomfortable feelings. Discomfort is unsettling, and disorienting, and our instinct for self-preservation steers us in the opposite direction. Yet, it is in grappling with discomfort that real learning and transformation can begin. Discomfort encourages us to look away. Now, more than ever, we must not look away or turn our back to the deep systemic injustices faced by the Black community. Rather, we, we must respond to the clear call for action. Delving into deep discussions about racism is uncomfortable. Acknowledging power and privilege is uncomfortable. Acknowledging internalized bias is uncomfortable. Acknowledging complacency is uncomfortable. Listening, really listening, is uncomfortable. Yet if we do not take the opportunity to talk about the uncomfortable, we cannot engage in the meaningful change that is so urgently required of all of us. To truly understand the complexity of racism, we need to listen to others. Listening is part of communicating. Active listening is a way of reassuring the speaker that you are seeking to understand them. This starts with a, creating a safe and private space for the person who needs to talk. It also involves being non-judgmental while you are listening. It might look like you are attending to their body language. It might be looking like you are having direct eye contact. When a speaker pauses, you might want to recapture points in your own words. And it's most important to avoid providing solutions, opinions, thoughts, and certainly not to interrupt the speaker. This shows that you are hearing and your mind is open to the speaker. Empathy, which is used alongside to listening, is connecting to another person by putting yourself in their shoes and seeing their views. It is having a deep understanding of what someone else is experiencing emotionally, how hard that might be, and essentially communicating to them with the words, you are not alone. And this is from a psychologist named Brene Brown. And she shares that it's a starting point to show that you care. Inherent to my title as the Director of Citizenship, I am charged with providing opportunities for students to develop a sense of social responsibility and to become engaged citizens of the world, while also nurturing an inclusive and vibrant school community. That is why I feel compelled to take this moment to use my voice to do the right thing. Together, we have supported our frontline workers, our friends at the Global Pathways School, the elderly, and those in hospital. We now need to come together as a community to support the Black Lives Matter movement. I need to acknowledge that my own white privilege has afforded me the luxury to ignore issues of injustice and focus on other initiatives while my colleagues and friends of color have carried the burden of con their continued fight against racism. I heard you today, Alexis. We will strive to focus our light on marginalized communities of Toronto. I recognize that it is my responsibility to educate myself on these issues, reflect on how my life experiences have shaped my bias, and begin the work of unlearning ingrained patterns of behavior. 
I'm able to identify what I have ignored, assumed, or let go that contributes to perpetuating racism. I need to get comfortable being uncomfortable as I lead by example and speak up for what's right. I must push back on that voice inside my own head saying, who am I as a white person to address the issue of racism? Who am I not? We need to seek to understand the reality and depth of racism as we work together to uproot it from our society, our world, and ourselves. In a quotation by Margaret J. Wheatley, there is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. We care about black lives and people of color in our community. And we want to ensure that they feel safe, respected, supported, and included. In the coming moments, we take time to reflect on black lives lost due to police brutality. We'll begin our moment of silence with 12 year old Kedron Bryant singing the song, I Just Wanna Live. His mother, Janetta Bryant, wrote the words amid the outrage and ensuing riots resulting from the killing of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020. Then we'll, we will remain in silence for a full minute to honor George Floyd and all other black human beings who have lost their lives to police violence and racist violence. Philando Castile, Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, and Ahmaud Arbery are just some of the other black lives that have been taken too soon. They just wanted to live their lives as we all do. And they were targeted and killed because of the color of their skin. We take a moment today. The New York Stock Exchange took eight minutes and 47 seconds of a moment yesterday. And the PGA Tour will blow three horns at all 8.46 a.m. tee times at all tournaments for the remainder of the season, which begins this weekend. Being truly silent and with ourselves is so important. And I encourage everyone to do this every single day. Our individual reflections are so vital in this process of healing. We need to fully know ourselves and the values at our own individual cores. These reflections need to be real and they may bring about a wide range of emotions. Embrace and examine those emotions as they're important in the journey to find the best version of yourself. The version that is gonna push yourself to learn, to act and to impact the world so it can be the best version of itself. Finally, our reflection will end with the Raptors video and poem, I Can't Breathe, written by Michael Tyler. The emotional poem pays tribute to George Floyd and is centered around his final words, I can't breathe. Black lives matter. Black lives are beautiful. They are worthy. They are beloved and they are needed. They must be protected. I'm a young black man doing all that I can to stay. Oh, but when I look around and I see what's being done to my kind every day, I'm being hard to this prey. My people don't want no trouble. We've had enough struggle. I just want to live. God protect me. I just want to live. I just want to live. Let us all take a moment of silence.
Can't breathe. The fear of this in my eyes. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. One man's life in the sidewalk check. I can't breathe. Ended by a knee on the neck. I, I can't, can't breathe. breathe. Look around, Look around at those, those you see. see. I can't breathe. See yourself as you see me. I can't breathe. If I have the next to die. I can't breathe. Ask, Ask yourself, yourself the reason, the reason why. why. Let's all, Let's all breathe. 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 Let's all breathe. Let's, Let's all, all rise, rise above. above. Let's, Let's all breathe. breathe. With newfound new hope, hope and unbound love, love, unbound love, love. Not love. With newfound hope and unbound love. We need action. I promise, we will take action. So this is just start of the conversation and the work to be done. We have lots to do as a community. It's time to collect our voices, align our thinking and strategy, and stand up against racism and normalize white supremacy wherever and wherever we see it. While it is important to look outwards into our community for ways to action this work through voting, volunteering, allying, connecting, or activating others, it, all, it is also just as important to look inward at ourselves and our own school community of systems and structures to identify places where it has been hiding in plain sight, but because of our privilege, we just couldn't see it. This is not easy work, but neither is living with this visible and invisible oppression that black people and people of color feel every day. I, we, stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and with every organization that is fighting for racial uh, equality, equity, and justice. We hope that you've heard something today that will help you reflect so that you can be part of this change. Students, I encourage you now to continue the conversation after this assembly and join us in the Google Meet. The code has been emailed to you and is an opportunity to connect with everyone to now begin to share and step into that space of uncomfortability that we all have to practice and begin to be the change we seek. Faculty and staff, you're invited to this evening's Coffee Connects. Like yesterday, another opportunity where we can talk about action and all the levers available to us to create change. I look forward to that conversation. Thank you for joining us today, York School.